All right. Welcome to uh, today's seminar, which I am calling How to Speak Facebook. This is uh, episode two in a series, which I have no idea how long will last, uh, that I'm calling Communicating in the Digital Age. My name is Reverend Dr. Wes Magruder, lecturer here at Seth Mokotini Methodist Seminary, and I am um, hosting this call from my office here at SMMS today. Um, uh, I am, I've been here at SMMS for a year now. I am originally from Dallas, Texas, where I was, and I guess still am, a United Methodist ordained pastor. Um, if you're not familiar with the Zoom platform, let me just give you a couple of very quick notes so that you can enjoy this seminar. Uh, you probably already know how to do Zoom, but first of all, uh, you have a choice of how to view the presentation. Um, you can use gallery view in which you see all the participants, or you can put it on speaker view and then you'll just see whoever is speaking, which will mostly be me. Now I am gonna be sharing um, a PowerPoint presentation on the screen, so that will be up for much of the time. Um, also, uh, we are gonna have different times throughout the presentation for questions and answers. So uh, I just ask you to hold your questions until we get to one of those places. Uh, at that point, um, I will call on you, I will go into gallery view, uh, you can always leave a message or a question in the chat box, which you'll see uh, at the bottom of your screen, a chance to uh, ask a question. There's also a way to raise your hand or to make some other um, uh, motion to show that you wanna ask a question. I'm also recording this presentation just as I did Mondays and we'll make it available. In fact, episode one is available on YouTube. You can watch a video recording of it. I also have made available an audio only version, um, which is not nearly as uh, bulky and it's just the audio. Um, the video version, I also cut out those places where we were interrupted. If you recall last time we were interrupted a couple of times, I got knocked offline and we had a, a power tool working in the next apartment. So hopefully you're not gonna have that uh, disruption uh, like we did. So. Without further ado, let's get started, and I'm going to share my screen here with you. Um, I'm calling this, as I said, How to Speak Facebook, and I want to begin and show you what I, our agenda, uh, again, what I'm going to cover in this, um, who knows, hour, hour and a half presentation. First of all, I'm going to address the question, why? Why this seminar? What inspired me to do this? Um, then we're going to talk about um, your online persona. Now, this actually will apply to all social media platforms, um, but I'm presenting it today because um, um, this is the first time I'm, I'm covering social media platforms specifically. So we're just going to have a conversation about your online persona. Okay, and you'll see what I mean when I get to that. Then we're going to go specifically to Facebook as a communication platform and ask, you know, what are the unique features of Facebook? What makes Facebook um, the communication platform that it is? What does it do well? What does it not do well? Then we're going to get into uh, a few, they're basically tips, um, but I'm calling it Facebooking with purpose. And, and some ways, some things I've learned, uh, some things I've learned the hard way, um, uh, about how to use Facebook effectively. And then we will leave plenty of time for questions, answers, comments. Now, I also want to say that by no means am I a Facebook expert, and I don't claim to be. If you are my Facebook friend, um, you'll see that I don't necessarily <laughs> keep all the tips that I'm gonna throw out here today. It's, it's, you know, for one thing, it does take work, it takes focus, and there have been times when I've stepped back from Facebook, there are other times that I've stepped forward into Facebook to try to use it as fully as possible. I think um, all of you probably recognize that there is a great value in Facebook, especially as a minister. So we're gonna talk about that, and, um, and we'll just see what we come up with. So I'm, I'm actually hoping to learn from you uh, as well today. Okay, let's talk about the why. Now, in, in episode one, I tried to impress upon all of you the importance of communication as a, as a uh, 
minister of the gospel. It is the one job skill that is absolutely vital and necessary to be a minister. Um, no matter what age or time you live in, you have to communicate in order to be a minister of the gospel. That's uh, sort of the point. Uh, for one thing, one of your weekly tasks is to preach. What is preaching but communication? But I also argued that in today's world, in order to be an effective communicator, we must absolutely master the skills of digital communication. And so that's why I want to take up some of the various social media platforms one by one and look at them closely. We're going to talk about how they differ from each other, uh, what they're built to do best, what, they're, what they don't do well, and then how to use them in ministry. So this episode is focusing specifically on Facebook, but by the end, by the time we've gone through several different episodes with other social media platforms, then we're going to have a sense of, you know, uh, if, if I want to accomplish this, if I want to communicate this kind of message, what is the best platform? And hopefully you'll have a sense, oh, Facebook is better for this. Twitter is better for this. Instagram is better for this. So that's, that's kind of the way I'm approaching this uh, as a presenter. Now we begin with Facebook today because it is the king of social media. Okay, there, it is the major, it is the number one social media platform in the world in terms of sheer number of users. So it dominates the world of media. And as a minister, um, I have a very good feeling that a large number of your congregants will be on Facebook. And so we have to ask simply, what does that fact mean for you as a minister? How will it affect the way you do your job, uh, the way you lead, the way you provide pastoral care, the way you communicate? So um, I think that you would agree with me. Um, if I asked you each individually, <laughs> you would agree that Facebook uh, is something that the people in your church will be familiar with. Now, I also wanna say this before we get started, my presentation is not gonna be focused so much on the technology of Facebook or on the features of Facebook. Now, I leave it to you to get to know the ins and outs of Facebook. So if you're an absolute beginner to Facebook, you've never been on it before, this seminar is not for you. Uh, because I'm not going to walk you through how to do that, you know, where certain buttons are located. Um, you already know that, you know how it works, you know how to post things. I want to talk about it in a more general, broad view and, and consider it as a communication platform. And so in that sense, we're going to be kind of looking at Facebook from, say, the balcony, a balcony level view, looking at it as a whole rather than um, sitting on the front row or being close up. So hope that's clear. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Um, so we're gonna get started in this first, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about online persona. And as I said, this has everything to do with all social media platforms, okay? All social media platforms um, ask us, or invite us to um, construct an online persona. Now, what is new about social media, what is new about this form of communication is that social media is a performative means of communication. Performative, now what do I mean by that? What I mean is that when we use social media platforms, we are performing in a sense, in other words, People only see what it is that we put out there. They only see what it is that we post. And, and so you can allow people only to see what you want them to see, okay? So um, necessarily, by virtue of it being social media, what we end up doing is constructing an identity and then presenting it online. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about when I talk about persona. The persona that we use for social media is the constructed identity that we present to people. Now, uh, that identity, that persona, it may be authentic and real, or it may not be. You know, in fact, many, many people use fake identities when they go online. 
you know, or, or use one that's not reflective of who they really are. You know, they might use fake photos of themselves or fake names or say they live in places where they don't really live. They may claim to be experts when they're not. And that's something that you can get away with on social media because social media is uh, performative and you construct a persona when you get on it. So um, what, this, what this tells us and what it's important to think about as, as ministers or well, just as human beings is that the person you present online is constructed and it's made up of all the words, all the images, all the pictures, all the videos, all the memes that you post. And this persona, this online presentation of yourself may or may not correspond to reality, okay? And I think most of us kind of understand this at its core because I think we've all known perhaps someone in real life um, and then you visit their Facebook page and you see pictures of them that are obviously much more flattering than what they really look like in real life. And you go, who is that? That, that can't be so-and-so. Um, or you, um, you notice that they only post the happy moments in their life or the, or the good things. And, and you know so much more about their real life that you recognize, oh, this is a constructed identity. Um, that this person has put out onto social media. Now, we could talk a lot about how this, what effect this has on people, right? Especially on young people or on anybody who, or with anybody who struggles with low self-esteem. Um, if you follow a bunch of people online who always present themselves as happy, successful, um, attractive, always surrounded by friends, then it can obviously lead to uh, an unhealthy sense of inadequacy, right? And um, again, that's a whole nother topic, a whole nother debate around social media and its uh, healthiness. But what I want us to do is instead to consider a different, um, a different aspect of this phenomenon. And that is really the question, what is the appropriate online persona for a minister? I'm going to ask that again. What is the appropriate online persona for a minister? Okay. Now, let me, let me throw out this scenario. This is an imaginative scenario. Imagine that you are the member of a church, and you are appointed a new minister, and you know that the new minister is coming in a few months, and you're excited to receive the new minister, and so you find out that he's on Facebook, and so you become a friend with that minister, and the minister accepts your invitation, and you go to his page and you start scrolling through to see what kind of things the minister posts. And that raises a lot of questions, doesn't it? What do you hope to see from this minister on his Facebook page? What kind of photos do you want to see? What kind of videos do you want to see? What kind of things do you not want to see? Yeah? You see how your image and your understanding of the minister is before you even meet him in person, him or her in person, you're already being presented an online persona. Um, and so again, what kind of words? Would you be offended if you saw the minister use uh, obscene language in his post? Would you be offended if you saw the minister posted racial jokes and racist jokes and memes? Um, what if you saw that the minister in some of his posts complained about the, the previous members of his church, right? I think you see where I'm going here. I don't want to offer any specific advice yet about what is appropriate for a minister or not. I just want to remind you that you have to consider these kind of questions um, when you go online. When you go online as a minister, you have to keep in mind um, uh, your position, your role, your place in the church. And so um, since you have the power to construct an online persona, then you have to consider what kind of online presence you want to have. What kind of person do you want to be online? What kind of words and images and videos do you want to associate yourself? Um, you know, uh, you might want to consider 
the question always, what if the presiding bishop sees this before you post something? And believe me, in my past, I've done that. I said, what if my bishop sees this and reads this? What will he think? Uh, is that something uh, that I'm willing to, um, you know, is that something I'm willing to do? Um, am I comfortable with that? Or if you want to get really, uh, really religious about it, you can say, what would Jesus say if, uh, if, if he saw that I posted this? So think about the persona we have. Now, here's something, one other thing I want to say. An online persona is a public persona. It is not private. Um, in fact, um, you really should consider that anything you put online can be seen by anybody and everybody at any point in time. Right? There is nothing private online. Even though you say, well, um, I only have you know, 500 friends on Facebook, um, and so the, only they're gonna see it. Well, that's, that's simply not true. We all know that you can, it's easy to screenshot things. Uh, how, many, how many times have we heard about politicians or celebrities or famous people um, posting something online that they regret and it may only be online for five minutes and they immediately delete it, but it gets reported. It gets discovered because um, nothing online is private. And so um, that's also a reminder that you are a public person. As a minister of the gospel, you are a public person because you don't only represent yourself, you represent your, your, your church, you represent your particular denomination, you represent your circuit, you represent in one sense your bishop, whoever your supervisor is. And as Christians, of course, we believe that we represent Jesus Christ. So we, we just need to remember that wherever we are on whichever platform uh, we are on. So these are just three things that we have to take in consideration. Social media is a performative communication platform. It allows us to construct a persona and, a, and social media is always a public communication platform, okay? Um, one more thing I wanna say, well actually three things then that I wanna say about this in particular. Um, one, I would say these are three pieces of advice about the online persona, um, just in general, for every platform. First of all, be as authentic as you can be without oversharing. Be as, as authentic as you can be without oversharing. You know, our, our world today desires leaders and people who are authentic, meaning, um, and I covered this a little bit last, uh, in the last episode, um, people want to know that the person you, you present yourself as is the real you, okay? Uh, at the same time, especially on social media, there is such a thing as oversharing, which means um, someone who shares absolutely everything going on in their life, including what they have for lunch. They take a picture of their lunch, they post it. Um, you know, the, they post... Uh, what the traffic was like getting to work. They post a picture of their dinner. They picture what they post what time they go to bed at night. You know that can be uh, overbearing and oversharing. Uh, as a as a minister, you also have to consider uh, matters of self care and of uh, uh, protecting your family. So um, I think we could have a conversation about what exactly constitutes oversharing. But uh, I've actually known pastors who I felt like overshared and um, I don't think it was healthy. A second tip I would say is since social media means constructing a persona, construct a persona that you would like to grow into. Um, in other words, make it something, make it a persona that you would actually want to become, right? Make it a part of your, your progress and sanctification. Think about the values that you want to embody in your life and your ministry. What are, and, and so post as if you embody those values or as if those are the values you really, you really are um, striving for. And be willing to admit that you don't always live up to those values, but, but say that you're trying, that that's where you're trying to go into. That's what you're trying to become. So since that online persona is one that's constructed anyway, 
make it one that you really want to be. I hope that makes sense. And finally, I just want to say that online personas can always use more humility. Um, there's something about constructing that persona that that automatically is a little bit selfish and a little bit narcissistic. So um, um, there, there's always, I mean, social media is about saying, look at me, look at my picture, look at what I'm saying. So the more humility, the more um, uh, gracious ways that you can do that, um, the better. And I, again, there are specific examples even I can think of of uh, people who do that more or less successfully. So um, those are my three pieces of advice. Um, I am gonna stop here so that we can, um, I can look to see if there are any questions. I'm looking in my, uh, yep, sorry about that. That was my first, first time I've been kicked off. Hope that doesn't happen again. Uh, however, um, let's go back and, and see if there's any questions about this opening little section on the um, online persona. Do I have any questions? You can raise your hand. Um, you can um, put something in the chat. Anybody? Or unmute yourself and just speak. I don't see any questions. I just want to leave plenty of time. All right. Nobody's coming forward, so we're going to barrel forward and we're going to talk about Facebook as a communication platform. So let me once again share my screen. All right, let's talk about Facebook as a communication platform. Let's start, let's just talk briefly about demographics. I put up a few facts here. Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure. I think these, these facts you see up on the screen are a little bit, a little bit dated. I think they're uh, over a year old. Um, we do know though, um, Without a doubt, Facebook is uh, has the largest number of views, users of any social media platform. Um, I know some of these stats also on the screen have to do with the U.S. Um, uh, let's see, what else did I wanted to say about this? I wanted to just quickly, um, I'm going to share a different screen with you now. I'm just gonna go into my Facebook really quickly and share that screen with you. Okay, I'm just using my Facebook feed on my laptop. And, I, and I, of course, I know that all of you already know uh, what Facebook is like. Uh, of course, you already know that you only see posts from people who are friends with you. So uh, the platform is limited to people who you have already made a connection to, right? And so I scroll and you see there's, um, um, this here at the top is a fairly new development. It's called Stories. And so those are sort of like short um, pictures, short videos um, that people can post in that way. And if you click on one, um, this is what you get. You get a close up of that picture and it stays online there for a few minutes until, um, until it runs out. And then you go to the next one in your storyline. Next one comes up. Oh yeah, see, that's a video of a crying baby. I'm gonna X out of that. And then of course there's, there's a new feature here called Rooms. I don't know much about Rooms. To be honest, there's suggested groups you can join, et cetera, et cetera, pictures, and so on. But again, uh, you can only see those posts of people who you're already friends with, right? Um, 
The core of the Facebook, of course, is the post, which comes at the top. And you notice that it says, what's on your mind, Wes? So it invites the user to tell everybody else, to tell all your friends what's on your mind, okay? And then, of course, we know that when you see another post, you have the choice to like it, you have the choice to comment on it, or you can share it. Okay, so I think you're all familiar with Facebook. So let's go back to go back to the um, there we go. So demographic so demographically, Facebook is the king. Let's talk about purpose. And this is this is a better question. This is a deeper question. What is the purpose of Facebook? Okay. What purpose does it serve? Um, apparently, the mission statement of Facebook and of Mark Zuckerberg, who was who is the one who founded and created Facebook, the, the, the purported purpose statement is to make the world more open and connected. To make the world more open and connected. Okay. Now I would, I think that's a it's a bit limited. Um, and of course, I recognize, and I just want to say this too, I recognize that there are lots of problems with Facebook in terms of how it is run, how it's operated with privacy issues, et cetera. But I just want to ignore all that. I don't, I don't want to talk about those concerns. I want to talk about uh, what purpose Facebook serves in people's lives, particularly the people people in your church's lives. What purpose does it play? And, and I'm gonna argue that Facebook does three things really, really well, okay? And these are the three things. First of all, it connects people. Fundamentally, and I, and I really think that from the beginning of Facebook, this was one of its original main purposes. When Mark Zuckerberg famously started this in a college dorm room, you know, his, his goal was just to make it easier to connect with other people. Now, this is, this is what it means to be someone's Facebook friend. It means you've connected and that you can see what each other posts, what each other thinks. And it obviously does so in such a way as to connect you with people you would not otherwise be connected. Okay, now, again, I'm going to once again um, stop. I'm going to go to my Facebook page because I just want to give you an example of this, a real-time Facebook example. Okay, um, and I'm going to refresh my Facebook page and I'm going to run through this, my feed and tell you how I know each of these people. Okay, so I have, I didn't check before I started to see how many friends I actually have currently, but um, let's, let's look and see who's on my timeline. Okay, the first person, Parker Jane Holt, former church member. When I was, uh, in fact, she was a young person. She was probably only 12 or 13 when I was at that church. She's now an adult. She's sharing something about the fact that she supports Biden and Harris. This person's name is John Kay. Uh, he is a pastor in the Dallas area, so he's a colleague of mine, right? And he's just posted a silly meme. My first car was, my current car is, and you're supposed to answer that question in the comments, okay? Susan Baxley, right here, who shared this post, uh, was a member of the church that I just left uh, last year, okay? Um, here's an ad, skip the ad. John Altman is someone I've never met in my life, but he is a United Methodist pastor in another part of America. Never met him, but we're Facebook friends, okay? So I wouldn't know him except for Facebook. Here's Rachel Grace. She is the wife of a pastor friend of mine in Dallas, right? Here's, here's a member, this Amber Bixler is a former member of a church uh, that I was the pastor of 12 years ago, okay? Here's another pastor friend. So, so you can see my timeline is full of pastor friends, okay? But pastors from all over the country. Here is uh, Alex Andrade. Now, why do I know him? He uh, was someone that I did some um, human rights work with in Dallas. So not, a, not someone who was ever a member of my church, someone who we occasionally did things together. Melissa Bricker, former member of a church. Okay, David Gruber, 
this guy is also a pastor in another part of the country. Now, if I, if I spent more time scrolling through here, there would be friends from university, there'd be friends from high school. Um, and the point here is that fa what Facebook does is it connects us, it connects people. It connects people that you would not ordinarily be in connection with. And there's a value to that, isn't there? And we have to, you have to admit that that's a really cool thing about Facebook. In fact, I, I recently, give you one more example. I recently friended a person from high school. So someone who I literally have not seen for 35 years, who I remember 35 years ago as someone who, um, he was not a Christian. Uh, he was actually one of the bad boys in school. Uh, always getting in trouble, and he has become a Christian um, really in the last five years, and so he's always posting um, scripture verses and, and and sermons and such. And we uh, we've started communicating on Facebook. It's just really really good to make that connection. Would not have happened without Facebook. Okay, so Facebook connects people. Now connected to that is, is it build, it not only connects people, but it builds and deepens relationships. That seems obvious, but uh, the way Facebook works is that you get to know somebody when you see them post, when you see them commenting, when you see what's happening in their life, um, and when you comment, the relationship deepens and it builds and it becomes, and, and often what's really surprising is when you see things online develop that become relationships in real life. Um, and of course, um, there are a lot of examples that I've come across in my life of people who were um, maybe boyfriend and girlfriend back in high school who 20 years later connect on, on Facebook and then end up dating each other again and then getting married. <laughs> so, um, but just beyond our love life, Facebook builds and deepens relationships when it works well. And then the third thing I would say is that uh, Facebook creates communities where communities didn't previously exist. You know, I think for example about the SMMS Friends Facebook page. You know, there, there are several thousand people on that page. Now it's not just people who were students at SMMS, it includes, um, previous students, it includes people who are lecturers, it includes people who are simply interested observers, it includes Methodists from all over South Africa, and it creates a community that never existed in real life. It exists solely on Facebook. Um, and it brings together people who have a shared interest. Um, I think about actually the, the people, those of you who are on this conference call or on this Zoom call, I don't know every single one of you um, personally, but we, we, some of you got your invitation through that SMMS friends page. And of course, there are many, many different, many, many thousands and thousands of groups that have come together because of Facebook, because people have the favorite, a favorite soccer team, or they have a favorite political affiliation, or they, they, um, they went to the same university. So different ways that communities are brought together and molded together. And then again, they spill out into real life. When I lived in Dallas, I was involved in a, uh, a social justice group. And I found out when and where different protests or marches were happening through that Facebook group. So I would read about a, a march coming up through my group and I would be there. And so I actually became real life physical friends with people I met only on Facebook originally. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's pretty awesome. Okay, whatever else is shortcomings, whatever else is shortcomings, um, Facebook connects people, it builds and deepens relationships, and it sustains engaged communities. Okay, I wanna move on to uh, another aspect of Facebook, and that is the kind of content that you find on Facebook, okay? The kind of content that works well on Facebook. What does, what kind of content does Facebook do well? It does emotionally powerful content. 
Content that makes you feel. Content, uh, whether that emotion is happiness or sadness, anger, fright, passion, the best Facebook content makes you feel something and calls for a response. That is what works on Facebook, okay? So think about the times you've posted on Facebook yourself. What caused you to post it, right? You, you, wanted to, you wanted people to share in your emotion or feeling, okay? You wanted people to feel something or do something. And, and of course, uh, I got a few examples here that I've just taken from my, um, my own Facebook feed. And first of all, to show you the difference between uh, posts that are text only and posts that are pictures. And um, I think maybe that I got this out of place, but the, the most effective posts are ones with pictures, ones that uh, have pictures to draw you in. Um, here's an example of a post by my youngest daughter. She posted this a little uh, less than a month ago. And just notice what she says. I would give anything to, wait, give anything to, uh, I can't see it in my, um, yeah, something's blocking it. But this is a particular time when she was feeling a little homesick and was missing uh, us, her parents, and her sisters, who were in other parts of the state. So um, she posted these pictures. And why did she post this? She posted it because she was feeling homesick. She was sad. She wanted other people to know that she was sad. And you look at the first comment from someone named Connie Lynn Miller. Oh, I'm sure your people miss you also, right? So we post things because we're feeling a certain way and we want other people to feel them too. If, if something great has happened to us, we want somebody to say, congratulations, we're happy for you. Tabo, I, I, I took this example from you, from your post. Here's a picture of you with your mother and um, you're talking about having to you know, um, bury your father. And again, why did you post that? You posted it because you wanted people to know what you're going through and what you're feeling. And if you just look at all the comments that came in, I, you know, people saying they're praying for you, people saying, uh, we feel your grief, you know, we're sorry for you as well. Um, that's what Facebook does. And the most effective kind of Facebook comment, uh, content is content that makes you feel. That, that evokes a response, okay? So that's kind of why I posted some of that. Okay, now let's talk about some limitations. Um, we're almost to a time of question and answer. I wanna talk about um, some limitations of Facebook and dangers. And I have two here specifically I wanna talk about. One of them is the problem of fake news. Um, that's become a bit of a cliche, we've all heard politicians throwing out around the words fake news whenever they don't like something that's on the news. But there is a real thing that's called, there is a real, there is such a thing as, as fake news. And what I mean is material that has been created for the purpose of propaganda, disinformation, or deception. And I've got an example here of one. This uh, story came out, let's see, this is dated August 3rd. And it was posted by CBN News, which is a Christian broadcasting network in America. It's a Christian news service. And they have a picture here, which they claim are protester burning Bibles in Portland, Oregon. Now, as you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has been very strong in America since the death of George Floyd, who was murdered by police officers. And in certain cities, the, the protests have been going on for a long time, including in this city called Portland in Oregon. And this story came out that protesters were burning Bibles and burning the American flag along with their um, protests, which feeds into this story that's, that Donald Trump has been playing up too, that the protesters are radical leftists and, and they wanna overthrow the US government and install some kind of communist party, okay? So this burning Bibles story um, is powerful. And I saw a lot of people, a lot of people sharing this story, okay? Because it's a Facebook story. Now, 
what I saw a couple days later was it turns out that that story was part of a Russian disinformation campaign, okay? Um, it, it turns out that uh, some Russian hackers discovered that uh, they got a picture of a Bible burning and then they rewrote the story and created an article online that claimed that Portland protesters were burning Bibles. Okay. It's just simply not true. Um, so the, the, my, my, all I can do here is to say that there's a lot of fake news that is on Facebook that people in your congregation are gonna be spreading. And this is a warning to you to be careful about the kinds of things you share, okay? If you see a story or a news item uh, that sounds wacky or downright unbelievable, before you share it, you might want to, to do a little bit of investigation. You might wanna check. There's some, there, there's some simple ways to check on the veracity of a news story. Uh, for one thing, you can Google it, and you can Google, is this, you know, is burning Bibles true, okay? And, and you will find something. Um, or you can go to a website called Snopes, S-N-O-P-E-S dot com, and Snopes dot com does a pretty good job of trying to stay on top of conspiracy theories and trying to tell you whether they're, they're true or not, and then they will rate each story they find as either true, false, or somewhere in between. Um, I just, and I know that during the pandemic, this has been a big problem. I have received plenty of information that I know is fake, stories that claim that the coronavirus is a hoax or um, that if you drink bleach, <laughs> it'll get rid of the coronavirus. I mean, crazy, wacky stories. And all I want to do here is just to warn you, um, when you share something on your social media platform, you are... Whether you, whether you intend to or not, you are supporting it, you are endorsing it, you are helping it to spread, okay? So, and it becomes part of your online persona, okay? So before you share something, if you suspect that it might not be entirely true, then, you know, I think you have a duty to keep, you know, do your work first, do some investigation before you post it blindly, okay? Um, and then the second thing I'd say about limitations of Facebook, and I don't have a separate slide for this, is just to simply say that Facebook is not a good place to have intense debates, okay? I've told you what Facebook is good at. It's good at connecting and relationship building and bringing communities together. It is not a good place for debate, okay? So if somebody posts something that you disagree with, um, by, if you post, if you comment, you're, you're not going to change their mind. It's not a good environment for that. You can disagree, but as soon as you disagree, then somebody else is going to come to their defense, and very quickly it blows up and becomes a conflict that is not helpful. Um, so Facebook is not really a good place for genuine debate. So my overall advice is that Facebook, use Facebook for what Facebook does so well. Connecting, building relationships, building community, okay? That's, that's some advice there that uh, I have been burned. <laughs> I have been burned too many times by getting caught in arguments and debates that um, I knew we could uh, I could lose. Okay. Let's take some questions now, and I do have one already in the chat section, so I'm going to address that. Tavo asks, Doc, how can we use Facebook as a mission tool? As a mission tool. Okay, great question. Um, my answer to that, hang on, I'm just uh, fixing my video. There we go. How do we use it as a mission tool? Wow. Um, I think, as I said before, it does certain things well and certain things not so well. My argument, uh, I would ar always argue that Facebook is not necessarily the best place to do evangelism, okay? If you're trying to persuade someone of something, Facebook is not necessarily the best place. What I find Facebook good at is welcoming and inviting people. 
So uh, for example, as a, as, a, as a minister, if you have a congregation, if you have a church, Facebook is a great place to invite people to come, okay? To invite them to come to, to worship. Um, to, to, it's kind of like preparatory work. You can do a lot of work ahead of time to invite people, hey, come to our church, you'll, you'll experience this. In other words, Facebook is like the open door. It's the invitation, it's the welcome, okay? Um, and so if you, if you can build an online persona that is welcoming and inviting, I think that that is a very helpful and ultimately missional kind of approach, okay? So that, that's, that's really at core what I would suggest for that. Um, Ian's raised his hand. Tabo, if you wanna go further on that, you can ask me, um, you can ask me another question. But let's get to Ian, because he has his hand raised. Ian? Hi, Doc. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Fantastic. Um, this, this question might be purely subjective. So just from, from your point of view, would you say that there's an appropriate ratio um, when constructing an online persona for a minister, an appropriate ratio of, of what he or she shares um, on, the, on, their, on their Facebook uh, feed? Um, so looking at things that are spiritual or scriptural um, as opposed to things that might be more uh, personal or private, likes, interests, that kind of thing? Wow, uh, that's a great question. I, I don't have a ratio in mind. Um, I, as a pastor, once again, just sticking to, just thinking about as a pastor, I, I found that people, I find that people in your congregation appreciate seeing the personal, like they, they're genuinely interested in what your spouse does and how your children are doing because it makes you one of them, right? So I find that that's a part of the authenticity. They can see that you're a real person and you struggle with the same things that they do. Um, in, you know, and some pastors do this, do this differently. So you have to find your own voice in this, obviously. But I found that some pastors, they just put every, everything's on their own personal Facebook profile, right? So, so they talk about the church on their Facebook page, on their Facebook, and about their personal. Other pastors make a separation, and they'll have a church page, a church Facebook page. So some pastors who just kind of like to keep their, their private stuff on their own personal uh, page, and then the church stuff on the church page. I don't happen to like that. I don't like to divide my life like that. But I do agree that you, every church should have its own Facebook page, right? That, that is important. But I would always, I post on both places, right? Or to put it another way, if I'm posting on my personal page and it's about my own family, then I just keep it there. But if I want to invite people to something at the church, I'll put it on my page and also on the church page, okay? So um, I don't, I don't, have a great answer for that except to say that just remember um everything you put out there online about yourself ultimately anybody in your church could see eventually so you just have to keep that in mind um just depends on you know it also depends on on who else is on your friend list right um so if you're going to have previous church members who you're still friends with you know, you don't want to overload them with information about this other church that you now pastor because they're just not going to be all that interested in it. But, and, and we're going to be talking about a few other nuances coming up in this next section about what you ought to put on your Facebook posts and, you know, et cetera, how to think about that. So, okay, I have two other participants <laughs> raising their hands. So let's go to, oh no, I think I've already got to both. Oh, Tabo, did you have something else? You wanted to ask? Oh yes, Doc. Okay. Uh, it's 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 more on a question that I've asked. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me, Doc? I can hear you. Uh, I can hear you here. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. No, thanks. I can see the voting. My 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 question is when I ask about the 
the yeah my my my, my question when when i ask about you know being used as a missionary tool maybe if i may just throw you back it, it emanates from the example that you it about one seminarian who spent about 30 seconds doing nothing you know as a preaching in in in, in facebook so i'm asking the context of the current situation we are in mm -hmm. the situation the lockdown mm -hmm. so i i don't want to i i I know that we heard that it's an invitation tool, but invite them to what at the moment that the sanctuaries are locked. So yeah. I'm saying that how can you you use it as that particular tool, you know, to reach out to people mm -hmm. to still to tell them that Christ is Lord to preach, as you know, if indicated mm -hmm. in the previous section or the print. My assumption of the session of today, it was okay. solely be going to communicate and the right way to preach through the Facebook platform. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure maybe if I misunderstood. No. But no. Yeah, my, I understand. My question was related along those lines. Okay. Okay. Let me address it along those lines then. Can you hear me now, uh, Tabo? <clears throat> yeah. Okay. There's a, there's a lag between me and Tabo. For some reason okay uh yes now i understand your question a little bit more fully um i still i still want to kind of answer in the same vein um i still think that facebook is best is most effective in building relationships okay so i still think even in this particular time right now which we're in I think the best thing that Facebook can do is build relationships. I, I really think that, so what I'm saying is, um, if you, the temptation is to post the sermon online on Facebook, right? A full sermon, okay? With, complete with an altar call, right? So, but, but I think on Facebook that does not work very well. I think what would work better is shorter pieces that um, that connect people, that build relationships. Um, I just don't think Facebook is a hugely great evangelism tool. So what you can do is you can build relationships as a preacher. You can you can say you can you can post content that says to people uh, i you know this is a tough time but god is still with us okay in other words i i would stick to i would stick to those emotionally powerful appeals what are people and it's kind of related to what i said last in the last seminar um in terms of the pathos you know people are feeling things what are they feeling in this particular time they're, they're feeling oh, i can't I can't go to worship. I um, so how can you address that concern? What you know? What are they missing? How can you address that in a Facebook post rather than, you know, giving them the full sermon, the full liturgy of a worship service? I still think that there's something very welcoming and inviting potentially about Facebook. There's also something potentially very um, you can strengthen your relationships with people on Facebook. This is a time where if I, were, if I were in a church right now and I was pastoring, I would be spending my time trying to strengthen my relationships with the people in the church, right? It, it's, it's not really, and, and I, I say this hesitantly, this isn't really evangelism time. This is time to make sure that everybody in your community is connected, it, it is healthy, is not you know is emotionally healthy is physically healthy has what they need you know that those are the things i think in ministry right now we need to be concerned about and facebook does that very well um i have um i have a, a friend who on facebook uh once a week or even more regularly just poses the question on facebook how are you how are you feeling today how are you really and then he just lets people respond to that 
You know, it, it's a really interesting pastoral approach. What's, what's on your mind today? Sometimes he puts it that way. What's on your mind today? And then he just, in the comments, he, 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 he answers them or he talks them. So that's just what I happen to feel. I know that there are people out there who try to do evangelism. And I just don't think, I think now people are asking, uh, how do I stay safe? How do I stay connected to other people? Uh, how do I know that God is still, is still there with me? That's my incomplete, very incomplete answer to that, Tabo, but I think a good one. Um, Tandy uh, in, in the chat says, fully agree, Doc. This is not the time for evangelism. We need to focus on the needs of the people today. Um, I think what we'll find, I, I, would, I would say this too. If you as a pastor at your church do a really good job of taking care of people, that when we're done with the pandemic, it will have an evangelistic effect, right? Because people in the community will say, wow, that church took care of its people. You know, that, that pastor took care of her people. That, that church community stayed together through this pandemic. That, again, is something Facebook can do. It can help you with. It can help keep your community together, help them stay engaged, help them stay, you know, rooted together. So that's just, that's just my feeling. And, I, and I'm, I'm seeing some examples of that, of people and pastors who are doing that uh, well. All right, are there any other questions or comments? I see it's 11. I really wanna be finished in 30 minutes, if at all possible, okay. Well, then we're just going to go forward. How about that? We're just going to go forward. And I'm going to go back to my, um, my presentation screen. And we are coming to this section I'm calling Facebooking with Purpose. I'm going to give you six uh, tips. <laughs> hate to call it tips, but things that I think you really need to consider uh, to take Facebook seriously. And the first is related to something I've already, we've already talked about. I think you, we all who use Facebook really need to, to consider what kind of online persona we want to have, okay? This means reviewing the questions we talked about before and asking yourself, what, what is really important to us? What do we want to convey about who we are as ministers? What kind of church do we want to reflect? Um, and I think some really careful thought through approach to that is important. Um, I recall, you know, six years ago when I arrived at my new church um, in Dallas, uh, where I was for five years, you know, when, when I first became the pastor there, I remember sitting down and saying to myself, here I am in a new environment, what is my online persona going to be? What, how do I want to present myself? How much of myself do I want to present? And so at that time, I kind of made a conscious approach to, um, you know, who, who, how I wanted to present myself. And what that does is it helps you decide what it is you're going to post and what it is you're not going to post. What kind of thing you're going to share, what kind of thing you're not going to share. Um, I just think we should do it thoughtfully, okay? Because otherwise, the danger is, you're scrolling through Facebook and you just start hitting share indiscriminately, or you get angry about an issue that you see and you, you rapidly write a couple lines and you post it and then you regret it. Um, how many times, I wish I could tell you how many times I have written a post and then looked at it and said to myself, do I really wanna put this out there? And I've deleted it, <laughs> I've not posted it. This happened many times. And um, I'm always happy that I, I've deleted it. So decide what kind of online persona you want to have. Number two, this is related to something I said in the last presentation. Be a unique voice. Be a unique voice, okay? Be different. I mean, you can ask yourself, you know, use those questions, use those things I said Facebook does well, and turn them into questions. What, who do you want to connect to? Um, who do you want to build relationships with? What kind of community are you strengthening or building up? 
you know, use that. And, and so then be a unique voice. Do you, have you noticed that there are not many people speaking about a particular topic? Um, or they're not saying, they're not talking about a particular issue that you, you see the Lord moving you to, to address. Well, then bring it up. You can be the unique voice. You can be that person who can bring such an issue to the forefront. Um, I have to say that, you know, for me, um, for the last 10 years, um, even while I was at my new church, part of my unique voice was I, I was involved with um, the refugee community in Dallas. Uh, there, there are many refugees from around the world who were being resettled in Dallas, and there was quite a bit of opposition to refugee resettlement um, by you know, some racist and xenophobic folks in Dallas. And so um, I got involved in the refugee community, got to meet many refugees. I got put on a board of directors of a refugee uh, organization. And a lot of my posts, if you were to go back in my Facebook post and my Twitter feed, you would see me talking a lot about refugees, okay? And so I like to think that that was my unique thing. Uh, I also wanna share, I'm gonna go back to my, um, gonna go back to my uh, share screen. I'm gonna show you, I wanna share with you um, a screen from a good friend of mine back in Dallas. This is a pastor, but not a United Methodist pastor. Uh, this is Michael Waters' page. And Michael Waters is a pastor in the uh, AME Church, which is the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and this is his Facebook page. Now you'll see that um, this is his profile. He's husband, father, pastor, professor, author commentator, freedom fighter. Um, and he, he's a, a, a well-known person in Dallas, and I've marched with him several times in the streets of Dallas. We've been engaged in protests together. And I just want to scroll through this quickly to give you an idea of someone who I feel like does a good job of using Facebook uh, as a platform for communication. Um, so you'll see here his first post. Uh, he posted 16 hours ago. He was down in Houston and he was appearing on a radio station. So he has pictures of himself, pictures of the radio station. This thing right here, which says, For Beautiful Black Boys Who Believe in a Better World, is, the, is a book that he's just written and released. It's a children's book. So a lot of the posts we're going to see are him promoting this book that he's just written. Okay, we see here's a post about the coronavirus and how um, um, people fear that the coronavirus numbers are being undercounted in America. So this is a share for him. Uh, then you see here is, he, he updated his cover photo, so that's a post. Here he is uh, promoting a panel that he's going to be on about racial healing. Uh, here he is, uh, and this is one of his uh, a more personal posts. If you read it, it says, our young black daughter beholding a black woman who is the US vice presidential nominee. He said, breathtaking. These are truly remarkable times. Hard times, yes, but remarkable times still. What a time to be alive. And it's a cute picture because, you know, it's got his daughter, the profile of his daughter in the foreground and the TV screen with um, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden behind him, okay. Here he is, another place he's going to appear um, on, on a panel on racial healing. Um, here he is, again, this is a, just a, about the, the Kamala Harris nomination, um, et cetera. So you see, here's a very short one when he says, days like today reveal just how diversely opinionated my quote, friends are. Um, I think he's saying that because this is the day that uh, Kamala Harris was a, uh, named as the vice presidential nominee. Anyhow, um, he's got a very unique voice. And so he shares it by talking about, uh, by all the things he's involved with. Uh, Michael Waters is a, a good guy. Here he is. This is the worship service at his, um, at his church that he's posted, um, streaming live on Facebook, et cetera. Okay, just wanted to, oh, and then just scrolling down a little bit, we'll get to the personal. See, here he is. His wife is pregnant. 
Um, and so here's a picture of, of him and her celebrating their wedding anniversary, but also a sonogram showing that they've got a, a baby boy on the way. So he's not afraid to share the, the personal things as well. Okay, I'll go back now to my uh, presentation because I consider him a, uh, a unique voice, certainly in Dallas, in uh, not only the church, but in matters of racial justice, very involved with Black Lives Matter, and he's also an author. So he is a unique voice. How can you, and this is the thing I challenge us all to do, how can we be a more unique voice on Facebook? Okay. And number three, somewhat related to that, uh, and this is, this is an important point to me, and something I try to stick to as much as possible. Create original content whenever possible. Create original content whenever possible. Don't be the person who only shares what you find on Facebook from other people. You can create your own original content. Um, post your own pictures. Write your own words. Um, create your own memes. Create your own graphics. Original content is really where it's at. <laughs> because the idea then is this is how your voice spreads. In other words, if you have a unique thought, if, you, if you've thought deeply about something, um, well, share it. Put it up there. Let people share it. If God's speaking to you, maybe you can, you know, maybe God will speak through you to somebody else. Um, and don't be the kind of person who only shares content. You want other people sharing your content. <laughs> that, that's kind of the goal, um, especially as a minister. Okay, number four. And I see a bunch of comments coming in, but I'm gonna hold the questions until, uh, until we get to the end here. So I have three more Facebooking with purpose things. I highly recommend scheduling your posts. Now this is kind of a bigger picture stuff. This is when you've decided you're gonna have an online persona, you're gonna be online, uh, you're gonna be as unique as possible. I highly recommend you schedule your post. Now there's two things under this here that I wanna address. According to the research, the peak Facebook time uh, of use in South Africa is at 8 a.m. and at 8 p.m., which is really interesting. I, don't, I mean, we can, we can talk about why that might be, but research shows that the most people are, the most users are online at eight o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock in the evening. I guess that's, you know, on your way to work or, or preparing for work. And then when you get home and you're just doing nothing but sitting on the couch looking at Facebook. So what that tells us is um, the more effective times to actually post to be seen are close to those times, like before those times. And if you ask business leaders, business communication specialists about the best times to post, the recommendations in South Africa are to post between five to 10 times a week between the hours of one and 4 p.m. Uh, why is that? They just found that if you post between one and 4 p.m., then people are going to see it when they sit down and scroll at eight, okay? If you post it at any other time, it might get lost in the feed. But your best chance of being seen, um, and of course, again, this is from a business marketing point of view. And so if you're a marketer, you're thinking, how am I going to get people to see this and to respond to it? So if they're saying that that's the best time to post, then maybe it's the best time for us to post. If you want to be seen, if you have a message you're trying to get across. And I think the, the, the uh, frequency of posting is also helpful because uh, it builds your voice. It builds what it is. Um, it builds this, uh, the persona that you have. People begin to understand, ah, uh, Wes is the guy who knows about refugee matters. And so if they had a question about refugees, then I would get an email and somebody say, hey, I, I think you, you know what's going on in the refugee resettlement world. So I have a question. Well, if you have a unique voice, um, people may begin to, to come to you. Um, in your chosen area of expertise and ask you further questions or further comments. So this is just, um, this is just what the research says. Now, um, I have found it very helpful in my own life and ministry to schedule posts. For example, again, going back um, to my last church, um, 
I think I went through a period of time where I tried to follow a, a, a schedule, a posting schedule. And what I mean is sit down with a piece of paper and you say, okay, Monday um, at 2 p.m. I'm going to post um, something from my sermon on Sunday, right? Like, like one or two of the best lines from my sermon. I'm going to post that on Monday. On Tuesday, I'm going to post an upcom about an upcoming activity at the church. On Wednesday, I'm going to post, um, you know, I'm going to post something, um, a, you know, I'll post a Bible verse. On Thursday, I'm going to post an invitation and a reminder to come to church on Sunday, right? In other words, you kind of have this systematic um, uh, approach to how you're going to use Facebook. Now, you always are open to post something that comes up uh, surprisingly or unexpectedly, but at least you have this idea in mind, I want to make sure that I post um, you know, on a regular basis. So people are used to seeing your name, used to seeing what it is you're putting out there. And um, I think that can be very helpful and I've found it to be helpful. Uh, also, there are apps and there are programs that will allow you to schedule your post. I used to use something called Hootsuite, that's H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. And Hootsuite let me write a post, but schedule when it would actually post. So I could, I could actually plan out an entire week of posts ahead of time. And then at the time that I told it to post, it would actually appear. And you, and, and you can use Hootsuite for any social media platform. So not just Facebook, but also Twitter and Instagram and, and so on. And I found that to be helpful. If you really wanted to, you know, take this seriously, you can do that. Okay, number five. Again, this is a point I've, I've made earlier or meant to make earlier as well. Always, always, always use less text, more visuals. That's what catches people's eyes on Facebook. It's what catches your eyes, I'm sure. Think about when you scroll through Facebook, you're much, what you see first are the pictures, the visuals, the graphics. And only if the picture is appealing or attractive or interest you, do you read the words. So what that tells us is, you know, even if the point you wanna make is, is, is a thought or words, attach a picture to it of some kind and, and it will be noticed more. Um, I've also used Facebook. It, it's, it's possible to write an article and put it in a Facebook post. Um, but I always attach a picture to it. In fact, um, some of you may have seen it that uh, a month or two ago, I posted uh, a, a longish thing that I wrote about George Whitfield owning slaves and, and the history of early Methodism. It was a longer piece, but I attached a big picture of George Whitfield so that the as you're scrolling, what you see is a picture of this, you know, George Whitfield. Um, and then I made sure there was a headline to it that had to do with slavery and it catches your attention. And, and many people stop to read the whole thing. And I noticed that it got shared a lot. I mean, it had a lot of views, which really surprised me because it was mostly a bunch of words, but the visual helped. If I had done none of that, if I'd had no pictures, I don't know how many people really would have seen it. And number six, and this is also very important. If you're gonna be a Facebook, if you're gonna use Facebook as a communication platform, comment on other posts as much as you can. And also just as important, when somebody comments on your post, engage with them, answer back, okay? Again, this goes back to what makes Facebook, what Facebook does well. It builds relationships. So work on those relationships. Uh, comment on other people's pages. You know, the, um, the, the, the pastor who replaced me uh, when I came to SMS is a Facebook expert. This guy, I mean, sometimes I wonder if he spends all his time on Facebook, but he's a really good Facebook pastor because he's friended all of the people in the church. He comments every time they post something, I see his name there. He's commented. He knows what's happening. And every time somebody comments on one of his posts, he responds. He answers. What that tells people is that, you know, the pastor is listening. The pastor is aware. Um, I also discovered when I was pastor as well in a church 
that oftentimes people didn't tell me things. And I would only know because I saw they posted it on Facebook. So I see them on Sunday, you know, even though I had not seen them for a week, I could say to them, hey, David, congratulations on your promotion at work. And they were always, you know, surprise. How does, how does the minister know that I got a promotion? Well, I saw it on Facebook. And, you know, it, it's a personal touch. It says, hey, you know, the minister cares about me, knows what's going on in my life. And of course, it's, it's a great aid to prayer. We know what's going on in our people's lives. And so we can bring them to God in prayer. Um, it's just an enormously uh, helpful pastoral care aid can be if we use it correctly. So, all right, let's see. I see a lot of, uh, a lot of things over here in chat. So I want to address uh, some of that as much as I can. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment, put my face back up here. Um, let me read these for a bit. Nic Nicola said, agreed often the family of the deceased to attend the funeral connect with our SM community after the funeral. Yes, I, I, I see that as a pastoral care need, something that happens very well in this time. Tandy said, I'm going to revisit my digital persona profile. Thank you very much. Very profound. I've been struggling with that for all of my platforms. This will help. Good. Tabo says, yes, I agree. Jill said, I read this about this several years ago. Before posting on social media, ask yourself the following questions. Ah, this is good. Thanks, Jill. Number one, where did I get the information I want to share and is it accurate? Number two, why do I want to share this? Three, how can I, what can I do to phrase what I want to say in a respectful manner? That is a really, really good helpful matrix to, to set a questions that to ask yourself before you post anything. Um, I, you know, I don't know, I've, I've noticed this tendency that even in myself that I say things online that I wouldn't say in person and, and that's not good, you know? I think a lot of people say things online that they would not say in person. You know, it's almost as if the fact that um, you're, you can't see the other person, it gives you this freedom to say whatever you want and it causes people to say things that they regret, that are hurtful, that are harmful. And so when we're online and we want to say something, let's use the same rules. What, what would you or what wouldn't you say to somebody in person? So I appreciate that. Tabo says, I like the fact that you can't divide your persona profile, that today you are a minister, tomorrow you're a different person. You cannot divorce yourself from yourself. You absolutely cannot. You absolutely cannot. Um, I, I, that reminds me that, you know, even today, uh, there are a lot of businesses when they're hiring. Um, before they hire somebody, they check their social media profiles. And you can be prevented from getting a job if there are things in your social profile, social media platforms that are offensive or degrading. You know, that can keep you from getting a job and just amplify that effect. Um, for those of us who are ministers, right? Um, so, Jill says, am I prepared to receive backlash for what I post and defend it in myself if necessary? And so, oh, that's question number four. That is a great question. Um, and I wanna say that there are times that we as ministers are called to say difficult things. It's part of our prophetic voice and some pastors um, use their social media platforms to be prophetic. I am someone who tended to do that as well, which meant that sometimes my views were considered controversial. Um, but my question was, do I really firmly believe this? Am I willing, to, am I gonna stand by this when the criticism comes? And there have been times when I've written something, again, start writing something and I say, do I believe this? Yes. Will I stand by it? Yes. Do I really want to go through the storm this is going to cause? Eh, not this week. And then <laughs> delete it, <laughs> right? So you also have to keep taking consideration, you know, what am I willing to go through right now with this opinion? And then Jill's number five question is, will I cause harm? 
And I almost brought up um, the general rules from John Wesley as being a guide, a good guide to social media as well. You know, number one, uh, do no harm. And number two, do all the good you can. I mean, those two rules, general rules, which we're supposed to as Methodists apply in our lives uh, are good rules for social media. Jill then asks, what is the risk and danger of addiction? Jill, what do you mean by that? You wanna say a little bit more about that question? Well, so when I worked with teens, um, when I was a youth pastor, many of them were so addicted that if their phones were taken away or if like a life threatening situation mm -hmm. for them. And then I've known of adults who, um, who live in Facebook. They, they, yeah. they, so I think it's the few with us going onto social media so often with looking at posts, checking out posts, responding to posts, posting you know, and stuff. Yeah. Is there not a risk of being sucked into the Absolutely. addiction of, of what that is, you know, the, the, the time addiction? Yeah. I, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, I'm glad you bring that up um, because I, I found there have been times in my life where I've felt, you know, myself drifting into that, right? I, I could see how people get so sucked into it, um, especially if you are um, using your Facebook account to do pastoral care. Right? So if you comment a lot on other people, then you constantly going back to see who's commented to what you've commented and then, you know, et cetera. And it can really suck up a lot of time. That's why um, what's been helpful for me, so like if you're just asking personally what helps to keep yourself from being addicted, is you set a period of time and just say, this is the amount of, this is the amount of time I'm gonna spend on this, you know? And you make it the same time every day. Uh, so there was a period of time where, this is when I was scheduling posts, where I'd say, okay, I'll spend, you know, the first 30 minutes in the office I'm gonna you know, post and check my posts. But after that, I'm done and I'm moving on to something else. And then there's another half hour later that evening, you know, before I go to bed, I, I might set aside some time. So what I found is just setting some time parameters um, has been helpful. Just to say, you know, um, I'm not gonna become addicted to this thing. I'm gonna set, set apart a time because I view it as important for my ministry, okay? If you view it as, okay, this is ministry time, this is something that's important to, to my role as a minister, then you set a time period to it and you, you try to stick to it. Now, the question of teens and others who are addicted, um, that is a problem. And I don't, you know, as a pastor, as a minister, you know, there's a number of issues and not just the addiction I'm worried about sometimes. I'm worried about what it does to people's self-esteem. I'm worried about the messages they receive. I'm worried about, you know, the bullying that they might be receiving online, which happens. People getting bullied, people bullying others. Um, and then, of course, I mean, there's so many issues wrapped up in that. Um, I would just say be a constant voice that um, in your congregation and even online, be a constant voice saying, hey, you know, uh, social media isn't everything. Um, <laughs> I, again, I have a, I know this, I have this friend back in Texas who is, uh, I don't know her from church, I know her from some other way and her, she's a professional digital communication strategist and she takes, the entire month of February off of social media every year, no matter what. It's her, it's her job, it's her career, she's a specialist. You can't find her online in February, the month of February. She just takes it completely off. And she also takes occasional, you know, you'll just see her post, hey, I'm going offline for the next week, you won't hear from me or see me, bye. <laughs> and I think it's really helpful, really healthy. Um, 
And so if you can not only model that yourself, but also encourage others, because if you, if you can't stay off of something for a few days, you're addicted. So um, addiction is a problem. Um, so I would say, first of all, don't become addicted yourself. Um, so I think that's how I'd answer that. I have another comment from Lydia. I like that actually, doctor. Often leaders want followers to follow them faithfully, but they never bother to go the extra mile of getting to know their followers by at least liking their posts or comment and just showing interest in people. Absolutely. And, and the great thing about Facebook is it makes it so easy to do that. I mean, it really does. Um, it's easy to spend, how much time does it take to just simply go over there and press the like button to say to somebody, I see you. You know, that's what you're saying. You're saying, I see you. Um, I recognize you. I affirm you. I'm praying for you. All those things are just incredibly valuable. And it's, it, it's a personal touch. Again, this is where Facebook is good. <laughs> this is where Facebook can be helpful. So let's learn to, to, to use it in a helpful way. All right, are there any other, uh, any other questions or comments that you wanna bring up? I really, really hope this has been helpful. Doc? Yeah, I hear somebody, go ahead. Okay, yeah, no, uh, it's not going to be long. I'm, I'm just uh, intrigued and impressed by what you said. I think it's your, your, your very last point where you said that uh, you should try to engage with those who comment mm -hmm. on your post. Yeah. Now, I just want to take a sense by, for instance, in my case, I, I, I daily and religiously so send and uh, I receive almost up to 100 and that I think you missed the, the, the percent that that's number one do you if somebody just like how do you respond back to show that you appreciate the liking and yeah. number two on the devotion side that I'm doing every day yeah many people respond or engage the amen comment do I just leave it or do I just like it or do I just respond amen back to you again yeah. Because it's easier when what I do, I, 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 on a daily basis, I receive inboxes. People saying, pray for me over this, pray for me over this. I mean, I think I get over 20 prayer requests on my, on my, on my inbox, almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So now my challenge is this one. How do I engage a comment like, amen? And mm -hmm. how do I engage somebody just clicking a like? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's good. Good, good question. Now, again, I'm not the expert. Um, I'm not the professional, so you can find your own style to this, but I do recommend you come up with your own style and approach to this. Now, what I would recommend is if somebody just likes it, if somebody likes your post, meaning they've just clicked the thumbs up or the heart, if they've just done that, I don't respond to the like. Um, because to me, that's just a simple... What, what I'm saying is it's important to like other people's posts, right? So if, if somebody just likes something of mine, I don't take any pains to recognize that. If somebody comments, if it's a prayer request, right, I would say, okay, I'm praying, right? I would write, physically write something, or if they ask a question. But if they just say something like amen or cool or, you know, something like that, then you can like the comment. And that's what I do. You know, I would, I just like the comment because you can not only like a post, but you can simply also do a thumbs up to a comment. So if somebody has a very simple answer, I acknowledge it by liking it. Okay. Or if it's a funny, then I laugh at it or, or what have you. So to me, either way is a response. Um, some kind of response, right? That that's my simple, approach to that. Just for example, um, if you, if it's your birthday, you know, and once it gets out on Facebook that it's your birthday, people start sending all, I mean, you know, you can have hundreds of people saying happy birthday, Wes. 
And I don't feel like I have to respond to every single happy birthday because it would just take forever. But I do hit the like button on just that, you know, because that's my way of saying, okay, I've heard you, <laughs> but I don't have time to write a, wow, thanks for the happy birthday. And how are you doing? And I don't have time to do that. None of us would. So you just have to, to find the simple ways to acknowledge. Acknowledging, I just think is a, again, is a really helpful, kind, polite thing to do. Ian, I see you raise your hand. Thanks, Doc. Uh, just, um, just a question uh, regarding some of our seminarians who will be uh, be stationed in churches next year, and, and possibly some of those churches might not have active uh, Facebook pages or anything like that. Uh, do you have any tips just for starting up uh, Facebook pages? Uh, I think scheduling is scheduling posts is the most important for a church page. Like, I think the first thing you should do if you set up a church page is to come up with some kind of approach, how you, how you plan to post things. And it's real easy to do for a church. I mean, it's real easy to say, okay, you know, Mondays we post this kind of thing. Tuesdays we post this kind of thing. Um, I, did that, I did that at my last church, and I had the church, there was a church secretary who monitored the Facebook page. So she knew exactly what she was supposed to do. Um, I, think, I think at the time we were just doing four posts a week, but we had a system and she kind of knew what to post. Um, again, just to keep it active because um, for a church Facebook page, it's important to have consistent posts up because what you have is you're gonna have somebody you're gonna have a visitor say, oh, I wonder if I should go to this church. What can I find out about this church? So they're either gonna to go to your website or they're gonna find your Facebook page. And if they go to your Facebook page and they see that the last thing the church posted was two years ago, they're gonna to say to them that that's gonna raise a lot of red flags in their mind, okay? It's gonna say, here's a church that doesn't really care about its communications. Or it's gonna say, well, is this church even still open, <laughs> you know? I mean, because that's the, that's the question that's raised. So you got to have a schedule. You've got to make sure you're posting at least weekly. And there's so many things going on with the church that you can post about. Absolutely. There should be posts about every activity you do or, or most activities. You should be posting about worship. You can uh, promote the upcoming worship service. You can, we often... We had one day of the week where we'd post Methodist news from around the country or around the world. So she'd find one thing um, that was happening in the larger United Methodist Church around the world and post that, you know. So we just had this variety of content. And that it just, it's a way, it's, it, that's why I say Facebook is good at welcoming an invitation because it does have that effect. So just have a plan. That's the most important thing. Thank you. Your regular posting, yeah. So, well, folks, I, this has been a good conversation, and I've really appreciated it. I think I'm going to kind of bring it to a, a close now. Um, I have not planned or actually planned my next seminar, but what I want to do on the next one is I want to talk about Twitter. So, the next communicating in a digital age episode will be about Twitter, which is a completely different uh, kind of communication platform than, than Facebook. It's not as good as connecting people. It's not really meant for that. It's meant for some other things, but can be useful in a ministry setting. Um, and again, I'm, I'm also going to eventually be offering a, a, a session like this on Jesus's own communication style. That was thanks to a comment made at the, at the last seminar. This will probably happen, the Twitter, Presentation will probably happen next week sometime, but I'm going to wait and see as students come back on campus uh, starting on Monday uh, what what's happening and how my schedule falls out. Because hopefully next Friday morning I will be uh, in person in a class. That's what I'm hoping for anyway. So um, thank you again for all of you participating, and it's great to see all of you.
And also, I will uh, be making available on the Facebook page of SMMS Friends, I will tell you, tell you where you can see a video, uh, a video copy of this presentation should you want to share it uh, with someone or see it again for whatever reason. Uh, that's it for today. I will say goodbye now and thanks for joining me.